I thought you were ready. All right, we're live. All right, ready? Mm-hmm. Why some say the go, go to the live stream. Watching this is our goal. And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, by the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. They have sound. Oh, wait. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge All right, is one folks, that we're willing to accept. One, we are unwilling to move on. And one, we can't win. Good. 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 I know. You got it. Look at this. Are we going to set up? Oh, yeah. We have been given the scientific knowledge, the technical ability, and the materials to pursue the exploration of the universe. To ignore these great resources would be a corruption of a God-given ability. Uh, Tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Kennedy put wind in our sails on the new sea of space exploration. And that mission is it's a mission about science and the advancement of possible. Let us continue the quest to unfold this universe and let us continue to find unity in our discovery. So together As Don Quixote reminds us, let us continue to dream the impossible dream that now becomes real. And then let us traverse the untouched terrain of the once unreachable stars. It was the ultimate yes, here, yes. So, you know, peaceful competition. You guys, it was nice to meet you. I'll not assert that uh, it was a diversion which prevented the war. Nonetheless, it was a diversion. Well, she's intense. Uh, did a lot uh, apparently, both like sides you, but the high road. Am I muted? Of science, or muted. learning, and exploration. Eventually, provided a mechanism for engendering cooperation between former adversaries. In that sense, among others, it was an exceptional national investment for both sides. Hang on. I don't think we're muted. Mm-hmm. 
Mic check. Mic check one, two. You're good. Okay. Good. All right. Howdy and welcome to the International Observe the Moon Night. You good? All right. So we're live here on the Simpson Drill Field all around the world tonight. There's over 2,000 moon parties. We have a moon party here at Texas A&M main campus, Saturday, October 21. It might be a little cloudy, just like it's a little cloudy here at Texas A&M, but that's okay. We've got other moon features to show you. In fact, we've got a chunk of the moon right here. This is from the lunar Apollo mission, Apollo 15, the Apollo astronauts brought back many lunar samples. In fact, this is a chunk of Great Scott returned in 1971. And it's one of the, it was originally one of the largest pieces of the moon returned in the Apollo mission. The original chunk was 9,000 grams. Here we have 92 grams, 92.5 for a little piece of Scott. Sample number 15555. And that might not be as interesting as of what it really is. So when you look up at the moon and you see the bright sort of mountainous looking material, this is what's called the lunar highlands. And when you see the dark low lying plains, these are lava plains. This is the rock named basalt. Maybe you've seen basalt here on earth as that black lava rock sometimes with some holes in it. And so this here is a chunk of volcanic lava. Again, this is returned in 1971 on the Apollo 15 mission. And it is a piece of that volcanic uh, material on the moon. It cooled very far down below. If we could stand on the lunar surface, just like the Apollo astronauts did, this would have cooled down below our feet, uh, below 100 kilometers. It's microcrystalline or has lots of very small crystals that our human eye can't see. We have to use a microscope to see it better. This is because when lava cools very rapidly, it doesn't have enough time to form a giant crystal. The bigger the crystal, the longer the cooling time. And so for here, this is microcrystalline, and so it cooled very, very rapidly. The minerals that cooled inside are volcanic flavors, if you will. They are olivine and pyroxene that are very rich in manganese. Or sorry, magnesium, very rich in magnesium, which is actually really good so that we can help age date and measure different materials and ages within the lunar basalt itself. The other main crystal that's in here is a volcanic mineral named plagioclase. And that might sound like a bunch of jargon, but even here on Earth, actually the mantle way below our feet, down below, 
that makes up 80% of the volume of Earth is also that mineral olivine. In fact, olivine is essentially the most common mineral almost across the entire solar system. So it sort of makes sense that we find it in this material here. We can pause for a second and see if we've got any questions on the YouTube and see if we've got anyone asking away on our International Observe the Moon. Do we have any questions? I can check if we don't. Do we got any questions? We're going to type the questions? Okay, cool. So we're going to type up the questions um, as y'all uh, ask them. So please feel free to uh, ask away. Sadly, I can't give you one of our free NASA posters, but if you go to the International Observe the Moon page, you can download the official poster that's on the NASA International Observe the Moon page, um, uh, main, main opening page. So we're ready for the telescope. We're also gonna pan to the telescope. Let's check on the weather for you all. Okay. So don't see any questions yet, or you can just read them out loud to me. And I can, No questions? No. Okay. Are we zoomed in on this? We are. Are we able to see crystals? Let's see if I can show off some of the olivine. The olivine's green? The olivine is green. The darker material is the pyroxene, and the lighter colored tabs are the plagioclase. Again, these are the three main minerals. If you're just joining us, this is a sample. This is on loan. This is a very special on loan from NASA. This is the chunk of the Apollo 15 um, uh, uh, sample that they named Great Scott because it was one of the largest ones that astronaut Scott uh, brought. Some of the Apollo astronauts struggled to get some of these large rocks up so much they actually had to roll them up the side of their leg. They ran out of sample bags and the Apollo astronauts shoved them in tool bags and anywhere that they could fit. Artemis will be going back to the moon. It'll be the first humans back on the moon since the Apollo astronaut era. So we will get boots back on the ground. They are geology focused and they are training right now in order to get us back to the moon. Artemis 1 went in orbit around the moon, did some experiments, uh, carried some seeds, some different uh, 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 biology experiments, if you will, and they will be returning uh, or retur has returned after an orbit around the moon and Artemis 2 will be the point when the astronauts can get to the moon. So I'm going to check to see if we got any questions. Is there any? The moon map. So there are lunar maps available on, just answering a few of y'all's questions now, there are lunar maps available on the NASA website. In fact, all of the NASA images and data that we collect are public domain. So if you go to nasa.gov galleries, uh, there are lunar maps. The official poster for this event is actually more art focused. So you can download a, a high resolution image of it and it has lunar phases on it. So we'll also be showing, let's check on the weather ish. We're getting the telescope set up. So it's a little, a little cloudy, but I'll talk a little bit about the phase of the moon. So NASA International Observe the Moon Night that we're observing here tonight. If you're just joining us, welcome to the moon party. This is one of over 2,000 moon parties happening right now around the world. NASA encourages everyone to look at the moon on the same night during the first quarter, which is when it's half full, like tonight. This is an opportune time for viewing A at a normal person hour, not an astronomer hour. So you'll notice that right after sunset today, if you weren't clouded out, that the moon was already up and that there's several hours as the moon trends toward the western part of your sky and sets for the evening. So sort of all around the world, uh, we get a nice uh, viewing time for the moon at a normal person hour. Not only that, but tonight when we look at the moon through the telescope, you'll see that where the uh, moon rise is for the daytime. So all sides of the moon get light. 
there's no dark side of the moon. It's a little funny because the moon orbit time that it has the same spin. <laughs> the magic number is 28 there. And so it takes 28 days for the moon to spin on its axis. And it also takes 28 days for the moon to go in orbit around Earth. Through this combination, we always see the same side. So it's good to call it the near side. But the far side of the moon also get its, its daytime. So right now at a first quarter moon, the moon out tonight, half full, is when our near side of the moon is getting, it's basically noon on the near side right now. And on the far side, it's basically midnight. So they're at the tail end of their day. Meanwhile, the near side of the moon is getting more light each night. So every night from here on out, you're going to be getting more and more light. It's going to be more and more full. And that far side of the moon is entering its nighttime. Again, there's no dark side of the moon, but all sides of the moon get light throughout that 28 day. Remember that magic number is 28 days. So you get 14 days straight of sunlight followed by 14 days straight of nighttime. In fact, when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, we only ever sent them to the moon during the uh, closest to the full moon so that they would have the most amount of light to conduct their experiments, collect the samples, measure the temperature of the surface of the rocks. Uh, all of the great science that we did in, during the Apollo missions had to occur during a full moon time so that they could have light and also radio communications. And so as we send radio waves back and forth as communication to the surface of the moon, um, uh, you wouldn't want to uh, uh, be blocked by anything. So having a nice uh, clear signal um, was really critical. And also with no atmosphere, so no atmosphere on the moon, no thermal blanket, no way to actually keep things cool. So overnight when our sun sets, the atmosphere acts like a blanket to retain certain heat. Uh, let's see. I think I see a few questions coming up here. <laughs> uh when is the next lunar eclipse uh yeah great so that's uh yeah okay, we got the exact date on there for north america okay so yeah we just had a annular solar eclipse past through texas and so there's two types of eclipse eclipses there's one where you keep earth in the middle and you've got the moon and the sun on either side and if I'm the earth in the middle, my shadow, when you have the sun on one side and the moon on the other, earth's shadow hits the surface of the moon and that makes a lunar eclipse. When we have a solar eclipse, like we just had with the annular and like we'll have on April, um, April 8th, 2023 in Texas, keep earth in the middle, but now instead of being in the middle, moon is over and it passes in between the sun. So solar eclipse, sun and moon on the same side. And so that moon blocks out the sun. Uh, lunar eclipse, which March 14th, at least for North America, I know we've got viewers from around the world, uh, that will happen March 14th. Let's see, this question says, how come the far side of the moon has more craters than the near side? Ooh, this is a hotly debated topic. So um, Earth, and moon uh, generally, first off, are, are almost equal opportunity to get hit. But the uh, uh, near side of the moon, um, through the way in which it's orbiting, basically, uh, is, is kind of the less surface area that's the potential. So due to that funny spin, again, 28 is the magic number. The moon is spinning once every 28 days but it's also going around us once at 28 days so it's got this funny little motion here and um due to that essentially that far side is kind of got a, a surface area that uh, it can all get hit the same but it does seem to have a little bit more of a preferential probably due to the way in which it actually physically orbits around us, um, but the main two things about the moon are also that it pretty much has very tall mountains or very low-lying lava craters, which again, this is, uh, or lava-filled craters, I should say, which our Apollo 15 sample is an example of. Um, 
There are no mountainous regions on that far side of the moon too. So that might be why it's just kind of more obvious with puck marks. There's not other terrain as well. Let's see, I think another question might be coming. Yeah, they have a that goes through, right? Oh, yeah. I think, I think on their website, it really says All right, so we'll switch to um, telescope here in a moment. If we're getting close, we got maybe just a few more. Okay, so let's check out what our moon view has of that near side. Ooh, having clouds come. It on the telescope. The clouds are moving. Clouds are moving at least. So let's see how our view looks for you guys. Cloudy. All right, so we still got some clouds. So uh, let's answer another question. What is it called when there is a ring around the moon? Okay, so this can happen with the sun as well. And so that's an atmospheric effect that is due to Earth's atmosphere. It is ice crystals that are very high up in our atmosphere that are a perfect geometry to then um, disperse some of the white light coming from the sun. So it's very, very tiny ice rich clouds in our atmosphere that uh, uh, as the white light, so the moon is also reflecting white light. And so that white light coming from the moon hits the ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. And there can be a few different geometries for that. Um, there's a really small, I think it's like eight degrees. Then it might be 32 and 64. Four might be. There's a few different degree size rings depending on the size of the crystal in the upper atmosphere. So, ooh, how big is the moon? So the moon um, is one eighth the size of Earth. It has one ninth the gravity, so much smaller. Um, it happens to be that um, as it orbits, sometimes it's slightly closer and slightly further. So that's when we have a super moon. The average is about 280,000 miles away, but the moon, like when we have a super moon that we had a few weeks and months ago in this year, uh, it can get as close as orbiting only 240,000 miles away. And you see it about 14% brighter. And it takes up about two degrees in the sky. So if you were to chop up the whole sky uh, around even all the way below your feet in the circle, 360 degrees, the moon takes up about two degrees of that in the sky. And again, it's about one eighth the size of Earth and one ninth the gravity. Um, so we see shooting stars um, because, well, it's actually not a star at all. We'd be really concerned with gravity if stars are falling out of the sky, right? Shooting stars are rocks, meteorites falling through Earth's atmosphere. So someone asked about why there are more craters on the far side of the moon. Well, all sides of the moon could get crater, um, although it kind of seems like there's a little bit more on the far side. But that's from incoming stuff, right? There's no geology on the moon to erase anything. And so all of the craters that have ever happened on the moon are just there. And they're from shooting stars, which are actually just rocks, meteorites that fall through the atmosphere and burn. So we can see it because we have an atmosphere. If we went to the moon... We actually wouldn't, there would be stuff falling, but there'd be nothing for it to burn up in. There's no atmosphere around the moon. So we could see things falling, but it wouldn't actually burn. So it wouldn't be as obvious as it falls. If you ever see a shooting star here on Earth, uh, you see it like brightens up for a little bit. Basically the meteor burns the outer layer. It makes what's called a fusion crust. The fusion crust seals to a certain point and then uh, can't really burn anymore after it fuses and makes the outside burn crust. But then it still keeps falling, right? A meteor isn't a meteorite until it touches the Earth's surface. And so as it goes all the way down, we actually use Doppler radar to track it. So just like we see 
the um, uh, when a police officer scans you and he gets a Doppler shift of how fast you are going with your velocity. We actually measure the Doppler shift of meteor shooting star after we don't see the star and no, the brightness, the burn. It's not a star, right? After we don't see the rock burning anymore, we track it with radio waves so that we can go find it all the way on the ground. Um, one of the uh, uh, samples returned from an Apollo mission actually we think we found an earth meteorite inside of a lunar sample so it can be that there's earth meteorites out there so earth has been hit and there's stuff that's been um uh hit out let's see oh the orionids meteor shower i don't know the orionids off the top of my head we can find that out the orion so basically when we name a when we name a meteor shower it's when it's emanating out of that part of the sky so the orionids are going to be when you view them, they're going to be part of the sky where Orion constellation is, and they're particles from Halley's comet tail. So meteor showers come from comets, and shooting stars come from asteroids, which is a really good thing to double know, because comets are broken up ice chunks in the solar system that have a little bit of rocky stuff to them, um, and ice has very interesting volatiles and when these volatiles light up that's why a meteor shower has more color sometimes you'll see a red streak or a green streak or a blue streak but you don't see that with just usually one one shooting star is usually just yellow or orange um, um, and that's because it's a chunk of an asteroid versus uh, meteor showers come from comets which have ices and volatiles and the deepest crater um, one of the deepest craters is going to be the seas. We'll, we'll check uh, uh, the deep of that. And ooh, what happens if the moon gets too close to Earth? Aha! So luckily it won't anymore. And one of our demos that we have out here is conserving angular momentum. So if you ever come to one of our events, we have this really fun spinning chair. Maybe you've seen the uh, uh, dancer or the figure skater when they spin with their arms out. It's kind of slow, but when they bring their arms in, speed. This is due to the conservation of angular momentum. And this is important for the Earth-Moon system because as the Earth-Moon system conserve angular momentum, the Moon is never going to hit us. So the Moon actually, when it formed, it formed closer to us and what I like to call a sideways snowball effect that coalesced more and more and more until the Moon formed. In fact, some people theorize that two Moon formed. And for our far side of the Moon question, someone asked about craters. Well, we think that the smaller moon actually crashed into the far side of the moon, and that's why it's all one topography on the far side, but that's another scientific de debate. At the very least, um, oh, we had another question pop up. I don't know where the other one went. Uh, okay, we're getting things. Ooh, we're getting a lot. You guys are asking a lot of questions now. Um, but essentially, uh, um, after that sideways snowball effect, it, ha it formed and it stole angular momentum from Earth. And so when it stole angular momentum from Earth, when it was closer in, it was really fast. And so Earth days were only eight hours long. And as the moon is actually trailing away, it's slowing down. It's like the slow of the figure skater, getting a wider radius, we're slowing down. And so the moon is actually spiraling away and Earth day is also increasing. So over time, remember how we have to sneak in a leap year every so often? Well, that's because the, the amount of seconds per year actually changes because of that conservation of angular momentum. So, hooray, the moon will never actually hit us. We actually have to worry about the opposite, uh, uh, spiraling away. So new craters form from things hitting it. There is no geology on the surface of the moon. So um, things that cooled and crystallized long ago. So again, our sample here is 4 billion years old. This is from Apollo 15. Uh, that means that if something whacks it and hits it and surface of the moon leaves a crater, it's going to pretty much stay there. Um, we see things hitting the moon just like you see a shooting star here. Um, there's been photography, especially when people do lunar eclipse photography. So if you take a lot of photos during an eclipse, uh, there's been times where when Earth's shadow is on the Earth, on the moon for a lunar eclipse, it's dark enough to actually see tiny impacts happening. So we have actually seen meteors hit the moon in recent Earth time. And so I would say things are falling all the time. Uh, every day, even here on Earth, things are falling. Um, so new craters, although they're mostly small things now, 
Luckily, the earliest part of the solar system had bigger asteroids and bigger impactors, but woo, we know the dinosaur days are over, right? The, we think that 60 million years ago, another really big thing hit, but we think that the big impactors uh, have, have uh, already been done. So only small craters from here on out. Let's see, is the moon cycle always the same length or is it similar to Earth uh, that it's 365.25 days? Yeah, so good question. So the moon cycle um, is probably technically growing as well. I don't know the value, but the magic number is 28 and that's 28 Earth days. So it's 28 Earth days to spin on its axis. So a moon day, a moon day is 28 days, which also is like a month, which is also a year. It's super odd. And again, this is probably the way in which the moon formed around us. So magic number is 28. A moon day is a month, is a year. And as it spins on its axis, it just so happens that this weird rate allows us to only see the same side of the moon. So um, uh, much shorter than an Earth year, right? Um, and that's why you get to see the near side of the moon go through a crescent moon, a half full moon like tonight, the full moon as we go through that 28 day cycle as it is orbiting around, um, but orbiting at this uh, particular constraint where a day is a year. The moon is, a, a, I won't say that's common in the solar system, but we only know of one solar system uh, uh, that we live in for these types of constraints. Uh, what is the, oh, how old is the moon and what is the moon made of? Any rare elements? And so, yeah, that's great. If we want to pan back into the, uh, to the sample here, this is a good question. So how old is the moon? Well, this is a pretty old sample. Uh, one age date on this sample. So this is from Apollo 15. This uh, has measurements as old as 4.5 billion years old. So we think that it formed uh, pretty early on when the moon formed. It's basically as old as the moon. Um, the material that it's made of is volcanic rock. So most of the moon is volcanic rock that has enrichments in iron and titanium and magnesium. Uh, and also the moon is really rich in calcium uh, uh, compared to Earth. In general, we have a lot of the same composition as the moon. And that's leading into our next question is uh, how did the moon form? Well, the moon formed uh, the, the, the best running theory that we have for moon formation is that something hit Earth very hard. Something hit Earth one third the size of Earth. So this is about the size of Mars. So we basically had a Mars-sized planet hit Earth, and this was such a catastrophic uh, collision. The whole planet didn't rip in half, but we could have gotten close to ripping in half. But basically, a lot of that material from the impactor, which, of course, we love to name things, named Theia. Theia and Earth material blasted off and sort of mixed together in what I like to call the sideways snowball effect. And so the sideways snowball effect formed and coalesced into the material that we know and love as the moon. And what I mentioned earlier is that some theorize that Earth actually had two moons, that there was two little moons that formed here. And maybe the smaller moon whacked into our big moon, and that's why we only have one moon. So it's still, uh, with many science, you know, a running theory, it's a huge... Thing to quantify the entire moon, right? Um, but looking at the geochemistry, so the isotopes, the cooling ages, when did things actually form? So we got to bring back more samples of the moon. We actually only have like five spots on the moon that we brought back stuff from. And so uh, the geology can help us tell, tell us how it formed, but also the big picture theory of things actually um, uh, moving in that dynamical space for um, conservation of angular momentum, like we said, and that sideways snowball effect for it actually forming. Um, is it possible to see the other side of the moon from Earth? No, sadly. Sadly, due to that funny orbit, 28 days on its axis to spin is the same amount of time that it takes to go around the moon. So uh, we do have to have an orbiter in, or uh, a lander that goes on the far side. So I will say that the whole point of this moon party is because of NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera, or LROC. Basically, NASA got the very first images back, and they were so excited, they said we should throw a moon party. So the moon party that you're experiencing here is actually due to the fact that we got pictures of the far side, and LROC, LROC orbits around the moon in all sides. It's in a polar orbit, and so it gets to see all surfaces of the moon and take pictures of it. 
So that's why we have pictures of the far side of the moon because we have a telescope uh, with a camera, a giant camera affixed on the back of it that's uh, taking images and giving us the far side. So we don't get to see it as we stand here on Earth, but we see it from our orbital cameras, uh, especially uh, that special one, Elrock, that the moon party that you're experiencing tonight is actually all based off of. Ooh, what would happen if Earth's magnetic field switched poles? And so we measure this. Um, actually, um, a lot of uh, lava rock has um, metals in it that can actually see north and south polarity with magnetic um, uh, dipole switching. And so uh, every, uh, it's on the scale of hundreds of thousands of years. Every couple hundreds of thousands of years, Earth polarity actually switches. So where the north magnetic north is actually kind of goes out of the south pole and back to the north pole area. It doesn't line up perfectly with our axial tilt, but essentially uh, volcanic minerals can capture the switching. And so um, the moon um, materials are, and the moon's technically in our magnetic field. So uh, it could be that you could actually measure Earth's magnetic field in the metals in uh, such Apollo samples. The thing is, you have to know when you walk up to the rock on the surface, you have to know the orientation in which it was sitting. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in the beginning of our live stream, some of those rocks were so big that the astronauts were rolling them up their body. So you really do have to know the, the placement, the direction of the rock in place uh, in order to study magnetic fields. Um, meteorites do have magnetic fields and we think that there were small planetesimals that probably had magnetic fields at all as well. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, there is some evidence of uh, magnetism early on in the moon history, although I don't think that this sample is one of the ones that shows it. Can, can and would the moon leave our solar system? Probably not. It's bound to Earth. Um, there are things that come in from out of our solar system. A few years ago, there was a really cool interstellar comet. Um, this is one of a, a, a great math equation where if you go over the value of one, you're not bound to the sun anymore. So you can be on a hyperbolic orbit or a parabolic orbit. And everything in orbit around the sun is on a, a parabolic orbit. The value is less than one. It's all constrained to the sun system. And so Earth orbits around the sun and the moon orbits around the Earth. I have a hard time seeing us ever get kicked out. Um, but there are comets that come flying in that aren't bound around a sun, and those are interstellar comets, and those have a value greater than one. They're uh, hyperbolic, and so they're not following a, 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 they're not stuck in orbit around just one object. Let's see, have there ever been any microbial life forms on the moon? Not that we know of, not that we love of. Um, the uh, samples that we returned back here, um, this one was put in dry nitrogen to try to eliminate any of our Earth atmosphere um, uh, uh, tampering with the, the materials. This is done for every sample that NASA curates. They basically open things in very clean rooms with bunny suits, with dry nitrogen. Um, uh, every sample that we return to, in order to not introduce our own life forms on it, because Earth is a very dirty atmosphere, and so uh, we we really try to keep our Earth biology, but there's been no microbial life from the moon that we have measured. Will the Earth eventually become tidally locked to the moon? Um, I don't believe so. There are objects in our solar system tidally locked. I don't believe the uh, 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 Earth-Moon system can reach that point, uh, the type of uh, angular conservation. Um, Let's see, I think we can go to, uh, wait, let's check the weather. Is the weather okay for the scope? Let's pause. How does it look on the scope? Yeah. Okay. We might be adjusting for the moon. So let's just zoom in to uh, this sample again for anyone that may have just joined the live stream. Thanks for all the questions. I wish I had free posters to give all of our online people. Um, we got a few minutes left, I think, of this. Yep. And we've got a really cool band playing. So get in your last questions now. And uh, if the band wants to start to get back on the stage, we can give them that cue. 
So we've got Leboquin here, and uh, they're going to put some live music on, and I'm going to make a cloud for you guys, so we'll let the last questions come in here. How come Neptune and Uranus change orbit? So the um, uh, Neptune orbit um, actually uh, cuts off, or rather, I should say, yeah, the, uh, the Neptune orbit... Um, uh, and it is in a particular area that basically there's a second asteroid belt. So there's a bunch of materials uh, far out that uh, intersect the orbit of Neptune that we call trans-Neptunian objects, TNOs, which is not so much of a fun acronym. Um, but Uranus and Neptune stay at their same respective distances. Neptune's much further out. Um, but this is one of the reasons why people demoted Pluto from being a planet. So if you ask me, Pluto's a planet, but it's like a really tiny planet, it's a dwarf planet. And this dwarf planet and many other dwarf small objects, these trans-Neptunian objects, these TNOs, uh, in parts of their orbit, they intersect Neptune. That's because they are actually at this different inclination and they're probably left over from a different part of solar system dynamic history. Um, there is a lot of uh, um, theory for the, old, earliest part of the solar system that Jupiter actually formed much closer in and that when Jupiter migrated outwards it scattered a bunch of stuff and so it scattered uh, uh, and, and made things highly more inclined perhaps in the outer part of the solar system um, so those are things that might have been dynamically pushed out there um, hence why they have way crazier inclinations and also cut each other off they probably didn't form at that distance it's probably some dynamical push in the solar system uh, that shoved a bunch of material out to the Kuiper belt or the trans-Neptunian objects um, that we call, that cut off Neptune, Pluto being one of them. Okay, I don't think I see any more questions. Oh, last question. All right, we'll do the last one. Um, we'll take one more if it's there. How much closer does the moon more move towards us each year? So it's um it's a little bit it's going away. So it's like millimeters per year. It's on the scale of millimeters per year. So uh, kind of similar to how plate tectonics moving or like the rate of your fingernails growing. <laughs> slow, slow. That's why we only have to do a leap year every couple years, um, as that uh, slowing down of Earth occurs as moon goes further away. Um, uh, so it's uh yeah on the order of millimeters. A uh, very small fraction per year. <laughs> okay, so now we can go to the moon one last time. And I can narrate that. Is that looking good? I think you can hear me over here. All right, so we're going to switch the telescope right before the band gets going for you guys. Um, Good over here. Okay, I'm just getting the telescope. Yeah, that's the moon. Oh, nice and queued up. It's probably as good as we're gonna get with the uh, the clouds that we've been uh, having here, at Texas A&M. Again, we're at the Texas A&M main campus at the Simpson Drill Field on a not so hot Texas night. So they've uh, got the. Um, are they seeing the uh, moon right now? Yeah, okay. So it's a little cloudy, but you can see it's half full. So this is what we call first quarter. And so uh, where the dark meets the light is called the Terminator. The Terminator is where if there was an atmosphere, it's where the sunrise would be. But there's no atmosphere to give you a nice, beautiful red color sunrise or sunset but if there was a sunrise it would be happening right there at the terminator on the moon the um area where the dark meets the light is the best place to get surface uh um shadow detail and i apologize that well i can't control the weather i guess but if it was not on, not on a non-cloudy night the moon is one of the um objects that you get depth perception with the moon and saturn are the only two that you actually get depth perception with uh, the uh, mountains that are along the crater edge are basically uh, uh, at a side perspective lit up. 
that the angle of the light um, uh, allows for a big crater or a, a big shadow difference. And so um, just like if you could be somewhere with mountains and, and you're kind of cut off at sunset, you know, when you're really close to the mountain, kind of get those shadows on the edge. Now we're really far away from the moon, but the the morning light is hitting the edge of those shadow edge of those mountains and casting those shadows. Again, a little clouded out tonight, sadly. But if you look at images like the NASA gallery has a lot of these great images, um, and and when it's that first quarter, I encourage you to look at a I encourage you to look at an L rock. Uh, the whole reason this party is because NASA returned camera images from the lunar reconnaissance orbiter. But essentially, if you look at those pictures, you can see that crater detail and the shadow edges. Ooh, we're close to the band getting started. So um, if there's any final questions that have popped up, we can answer it. If not, we look forward to catching you all on our next live stream. Thanks for joining us. We've got a helicopter blowing over, so you probably hear that too. Uh, get the final views of the telescope in. We're going to pan the camera. Here in a second, we're gonna let ourselves have a music night out. I see a lot of you guys have some clouds. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's no atmosphere on the moon, but. Uh, there was. It'd be nice to see some clouds. We're just gonna make a little cloud here. Thank you. 
Shut it down here in a moment. We got our band playing out. We'll do the best to answer the questions on the live stream here. We're going to have a bunch of NASA videos coming up for you guys soon. Stay tuned. Look for new videos. Check out our shorts as always. And uh, this video will be posted directly after. 